you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, we're coming here to your podcast. Who knew we'd do it again? Hundreds of these stupid things, actually, almost an hour. They're not that stupid, though. I don't know why I said that. That's rude. Uh, why am I being rude to myself? Who knows? I don't know. Anyway, guys, watch the video version of this. We've got an incredible guest on the show, and you're going to want to watch the video on it. YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Voss. It's uh, free for an unlimited time. You want to go there and click the button and join the Chris Voss Show Army because you can belong to something. And what's great is we're like a family, but we don't judge you. So what could be better than that? It's just money in the bank. Anyway, guys, go to goodreads.com for says Chris Voss. See everything we're reading and reviewing over there. You can see my giveaways that we're running on two of my books over there as well. Uh, you can also go to all the groups, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, uh, TikTok, all those crazy places. All the kids are playing with, and uh, you can see everything that we have going on there. So we're excited to announce my new book is coming out. It's called Beacons of Leadership, Inspiring Lessons of Success in Business and Innovation. It's going to be coming out on October 5th, 2021, and I'm really excited for you to get a chance to read this book. It's filled with a multitude of my insightful stories, lessons, my life, and experiences in leadership and character. I give you some of the secrets from my CEO Entrepreneur Toolbox that I use to scale my business success, innovate, and build a multitude of companies. I've been a CEO for, uh, what is it, like uh, 33, 35 years now. We talk about leadership, the importance of leadership, how to become a great leader, and how anyone can become a great leader as well. So you can pre-order the book right now wherever fine books are sold, but the best thing to do on getting a pre-order deal is to go to beaconsofleadership.com. That's beaconsofleadership.com. On there, you can find several packages you can take advantage of in ordering the book. And for the same price of what you can get it from someplace else like Amazon. You can get all sorts of extra goodies that we've taken and given away. Uh, different collectors, limited edition, custom made numbered book plates that are going to be autographed by me. There's all sorts of other goodies that you can get when you buy the book from beaconsofleadership.com. So be sure to go there, check it out, or order the book wherever fine books are sold. This is one of the hot books that everyone's talking about. It's just hot off the shelf. just came out November 2nd. The book is titled Misfire. Inside the Downfall of the NRA by Tim Mack. And he's joining us today to talk about his amazing book. He is the National Public Radio's Washington investigative correspondent and was one of NPR's lead reporters on the Mueller investigation and the full Trump impeachment, or the first Trump impeachment, that is. How many were there? Three or four? I don't know. Something like that. Well, reporting for the day, there should have been. Uh, well, reporting for the Daily Beast in 2017, he broke the story of Russian Maria Butina and her connection with the uh, NRA. He can often be heard on NPR's Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and the NPR Politics Podcast. Welcome to the show, Tim. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. Dude, that's amazing. I didn't know you broke the story on uh, Maria Butina. That was amazing when that came out. Yeah, it's been a long, wild ride since then. That was something that I picked up in kind of 2016, 2017 time frame. Yeah, man, she fell off the earth, didn't she? She like, I don't know, in a gulag in Siberia or something? No, she's actually, she's run for office in, in Russia. And uh, <laughs> I think she's in the legislature now. Probably, yeah. Uh, oh, I wonder who she supports. Anyway, let's see. So give us your plug so people can find you on the interwebs and learn more about you. Sure. So I've got this book, like you mentioned, Misfire Inside the Downfall of the NRA. You can find it online. Good. If you want to pick what, your local retailer for books or Amazon or whatever else, you should be able to find it. There you go. The NRA has just been such a black box. There's not much known about the NRA, except for what they wanted to put out there in, in press releases, in their press conferences and things like that. I really wanted to pull back the curtain and mm -hmm. show something about the characters and the personalities and the people involved in this organization. Uh, that was something that really fascinated me, was researching, doing interviews, and writing about these people, of which very little is known. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's definitely a secretive organization up until late, and it seems like everything's just splitting right open for them. So give us the overall arcing of your book and basically the encompass of it, if you would, from a bird's eye view. Sure. So the book really extends mainly across the last 10 years or so. It looks at, at the NRA's history from Sandy Hook to present, approximately. There are, of course, places that go a little further back from that, but it basically looks at the main characters in the NRA uh, and follows them across the last 10 or 15 years. It carries the NRA from a period when they were doing really well during the Obama years through Sandy Hook. And, and that's a pivotal moment for the NRA to Donald Trump's election and later on through to its financial troubles and ultimately its bankruptcy and a lawsuit filed by the New York Attorney General to dissolve the organization. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. <laughs> anyway, it's been interesting. So you, how does the book start out? Because I heard in one of your interviews a story about how you acquired some documents. Were you writing the book at that time, or was this a proponent for, for writing the book, or, or what got you down that pathway? And, and I love to yeah. hear the story, too. Yeah, so I, I've been working on this book really since around 2017 or so. Oh, wow. So it's been four and a half, five years almost. Working on it for a long time, the, the NRA and people inside of the NRA's environment aren't typically very friendly with the press. That's not typical. And so trying to work my way in and develop sources and get some of these documents that we ended up finding, that was a really difficult prospect. But there was a big moment in 2020, 2020 during the, the worst of the pandemic when a source said that they'd be interested in showing me some documents. Now, I didn't have a car. There was no public transit, no Ubers. So I ended up renting a moped <laughs> and driving for what seemed like hours and hours to a place, a parking lot, where a mm -hmm. source pulls up and the window rolls down and they walk away from the car while saying the documents are in the passenger seat. So I reach wow. in, pull the documents out and put them in my backpack. And I moped away. And those documents turn out to be these amazing secret documents that form up a lot of the backbone of the book and a lot of the subsequent reporting of the NRA is just such a mystery organization, or at least has been in the past. And it allowed me to give color. The documents were hundreds and hundreds of pages of secret depositions that have never been seen by the public. Senior wow. officials in the National Rifle Association talking about who, w who was in the room, uh, what they said, what happened behind the scenes as the NRA began its decline and how that all occurred. It was an amazing set of documentary evidence. And it was something that just happened after developing some trust with the, with the source. That's amazing, man. I can see it now when you do all the president's men uh, uh, scene where you remember the deep throat in the basement of uh, the Watergate or something or wherever they were. They're meeting in the darkness. Only this time you have a moped. So that's really cool. That'll look great on film. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if it will make it into a film. Yeah, but it was a fun experience. I think mean, reporting can be fun, but like yeah. a lot of it is about developing rapport with your mm -hmm. sources and convincing them that you're going to tell their stories in a fair and accurate way. And that was something that was a real challenge, right? Because the NRA has not been friendly to the press, has not really been an open book in the past, and that's why I was so fascinated to do this project to begin with. Yeah, the, it, it's really come out lately that this Wayne LaPierre guy has just been, him and his wife have been using it as like a slush fund. And you had some really explosive reporting that came out of the book that you've been touring on, talking about some of these, the, I think it was the Sandy Hook conversation and tapes that you get a hold of, where they're just, number one, they're being really dismissive of their people that give them money at the NRA. Um, calling them, I think it was like trailer something or whatever. They just look off on camera or whatever. They'll be wandering around or how to deal with it. Touch on that if you would a little bit. Sure. So this was actually after Columbine in 1999. The Columbine tragedy was one of kicked off, unfortunately, a series, the modern era of school shooting. It, and it happened on April 20th, 1999. As it happened, the NRA had scheduled its annual convention in Denver, not far away, just a week and a half later. And so the day after, all these NRA officials and executives and lobbyists, lawyers, strategists, all kind of scramble onto this call to try to figure out what they're going to do with the, with the organization. How are they going to deal with this crisis? Because they've got this conference coming up, and it's really a lot of people consider it an affront to the community to hold the convention. 
right after this terrible tragedy. And so you hear a number of things. One of the things, like you mentioned, is you hear the NRA disparaging some of its own members. Wow. You hear them worrying about the kind of members that are going to show up in Denver after that convention. You hear them disparage them, these members as idiots and hillbillies and <laughs> um, nuts and fruitcakes. It's all on tape. And, and this is how some of the NRA's members, or some of the, the, the NRA's executives, refer to their own members. Wow. And it's just shocking to hear. Meanwhile, they're buying like $10,000 suits and just having a good old... Yeah, this all kind of segues one to the next. The Another thing that you hear on the tapes is you hear them try to strategize about what their playbook should be after the shooting. And you hear them consider a kind of softer tone, a softer approach. You hear them consider a, a million-dollar victims fund, for example, or canceling their convention. But as time goes on and these wheels are in motion... They land on this idea that any sort of concession at all will be as if they were admitting responsibility. Wow. And this is something that they carry with them for years to come. Yeah. Through Sandy Hook and through Virginia Tech, through Sandy Hook, through Parkland. This becomes the NRA's playbook over time. But what's so amazing about these tapes, this is two and a half hours of these strategists talking from – Wayne LaPierre, who's the head of the organization then and now, to its top lobbyists, to its advertising people, to its advisors, all of them just trying to figure out how to handle this terrible situation that's unfolded in, in Colorado, and then landing on kind of a no-compromise position, which they've held ever since. Yeah. The, I've seen the video of what's a good, there's a, the only good guy is a, the only, I forget the quote, the only good guy with a gun is uh, the only bad... You, the only probably... thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. <laughs> this is why you wrote the book. No, it's true. And and it's become so – they've politically become so entrenched. What what started the downfall of the NRA in your mind? They did this illegal contribution, and I think Maria, what's-her-face, was involved in that, the $100 million or something that they – wasn't $100 million that contributed to Trump. It was wonky and weird. But there was that redheaded gal, I think, too, that had – from Russia who had infiltrated the uh, – a bunch of politicians and people in the NRA. And then Ollie North seems like when he resigned, he was really trying to take out the NRA. And I've often wondered how much he's been working in the background to take that down. He, he seemed to be the one who was calling out them using it as a slush fund for all their rich wares and living high on the hog. Yeah, so Oliver North was brought into the NRA in around 2018, 2019 to kind of help them fundraise them their, their way out of a, a financial crisis. So... Just to put it in context, in 2018, the NRA is in such a serious in such a serious financial contraction that it almost can't make payroll. And this is a serious problem for any organization. So Wayne LaPierre, who's the head of the organization, reaches out to his old friend, Oliver North, and asks Oliver North to come on as the president of the organization. And Oliver North agrees and says, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. But as he gets on, he realizes there are some real problems with the NRA. And starts to wonder where all this money is going towards and demands an internal audit of the organization. This causes a lot of friction with Wayne LaPierre, who's the head of the NRA. And this all culminates in a climactic scene in the book in which they, they confront each other. Wow. At an Indianapolis hotel suite in April of 2019. And basically, Wayne LaPierre pushes Oliver North out of the presidency of the NRA. Yeah. And that's vividly described in the book in one of the chapters. Wow. And I think Oliver North threatens to out him and basically expose him or? Yeah. So very publicly, Oliver North resigns. And this raises all sorts of questions about what's been happening inside the organization. And a lot of reporting, including mine, uh, has been done in the subsequent years over the last couple mm -hmm. of years to describe what was happening inside the organization, inside the NRA. And we're talking things like millions of dollars in private jets, yeah. lavish meals exotic vacations to the Bahamas and Lake Como in Italy. We're talking about, you mentioned this earlier, six figures in Italian suits from Zegna, the Italian menswear place on Rodeo Drive. It's a real, it's a real expose of what happened behind the scenes at the NRA. Yeah. And you get into his wife, Susan, and some of the shenanigans they're up to doing all their different stuff involved with Trump and different things. These people sound like the most sociopathic narcissistics ever. Well, Susan LaPierre is such an interesting character to me because very little has been written about her in the past. 
And mm. so it's very interesting to learn kind of who she was as a human. So she heads up this elite world of million dollar plus donors to the NRA. And she's, she's someone who is super controlling and demanding of her staff. And she has a, she's a hidden hand in the NRA, right? Like mm. she's, she's someone who has a lot of sway over her husband who runs the NRA, Wayne LaPierre. She's considered by some to be the first lady of the NRA. And definitely, though she doesn't get paid to work at the NRA, gets all sorts of perks that would make even high powered corporate executives blush, things like private cars or private jets, and uses the NRA's nonprofit money, I might add, in order to expand her lifestyle. Wow. These guys are just having fun, being one of the crap on their, calling their, their, the people who give the money. They're not that large of an organization, are they? They're like 5 million or something? About 4.9 million at the last count. Mm -hmm. And even then, I think, don't they fluff those numbers a little bit? I, I don't remember. I think I read something there. They might be. So they, some of their members sign on year after year, one year memberships, mm -hmm. three year memberships, five year memberships, things like that. But you can also get what's called a lifetime membership and you pay one time fee for that. But there's not really a way to unsubscribe as if you like, if you buy a lifetime membership, you're on the rolls. And it's not clear that they take people off once they're, uh -huh. once they pass away. So it's more than lifetime. In, 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 Sounds in like the Mormons. Talking, uh, <laughs> lifetime and beyond membership in a lot of ways. But the, yeah, the, so they say they have 4.9 million members. The thing is, it's not merely the numbers. 4.9 million people in the United States. Are, you know, as compared to the total population of the U.S., you think, okay, not that many people. A couple things. There are a lot of people who are not NRA members who identify with the NRA. If you take an NRA training class, for example, they have tons of gun safety and training classes. Uh, you might identify as a member of the NRA. And there are many more who aren't technically members, but still would say that they support the NRA's goals. And when you talk to lawmakers about why they're worried about the NRA, they're not so much worried about money. Money is important, of course, but they're worried about getting their phone lines totally jammed up, their inboxes totally flooded. They're getting, they're worried about getting yelled at town halls. And one of the things the NRA has been really effective in doing is mobilizing its members to do that, to put the pressure on lawmakers. And lawmakers are terrified of uh, crossing the NRA for that reason. Wow. Five million member group runs the country that's 350 million you have to deal with. Do you talk about in the book, the, the there was that whole wing, Dana Loesch, and there was a whole video arm wing that had gotten, I think it was set up by a third party. Do you, do you go through that in the book and talk about that whole episode? Yeah. So that, what that is, it was called NRA TV. Mm -hmm. It was something that the NRA spent tens of millions of dollars, pissed off a lot of people, including at the NRA was, was, you know, because it wasn't just a, it wasn't just a gun. It, they weren't just doing shows about guns. They were doing shows about all sorts of things, including race and crime and immigration and things like that, that a, a lot of people at the NRA thought, this isn't a part of our core competency. It's not the reason why members have joined the NRA and so on and so forth. But it was part of the NRA's push to become not just a Second Amendment organization, but a culture war organization. And this is something that they really develop into over the last decade. They, they, they want to frame themselves as not just a gun organization, but a, a group that's standing between the government and the taking of your freedoms. And that's, that's the way they framed it. But by doing that, they really get ahead, they really get ahead of their membership and it costs them a ton of money and contributes ultimately to their financial crisis that they're in. Oh, really? Good. <laughs> Good. That's it. That was so toxic. The, ma the what they were doing with social media and that that arm of the wing. You'd see the videos and you'd just be like, "Oh my god, this is this is out of control." And the I, I remember one of my, one of the people wrote on one of my videos or comments recently. They wrote, and it was pro gun. They wrote, "The Bill of Rights is more important than the Constitution because of the Second Amendment." And you're like, "Do, do you understand that the Bill of Rights cannot exist without the Constitution? <laughs> like it has to." <laughs> It's built upon the Constitution. It can't be more important. <laughs> and so the misinformation out there, the, the people, you know, and really they use a lot of these different things just to bring out. That's really all this is. It's like when Betsy DeVos's National Center for uh, Center for National Policy uses abortion. They don't really care about it. They just use it to bring out the vote. They know it pulls out the votes. And I think the NRA does the same thing with guns. The NRA has really had a 
kind of big tug of war internally for many years. Mm -hmm. They've got the lobbyists in the organization who typically have been a little bit more moderate, who are interested in legislative compromise, who have to go to lawmakers and explain their position all the time. And then there's the fundraising arm and the membership arm, which is incentivized to pull the organization in a different way, more yeah. extreme way, because they've always found that fear sells. Yeah. In the Obama era, the NRA really did try to push this idea that Obama's coming after your, he's coming for your guns, your guns that he's going to restrict gun rights in some way. And that really helped with fundraising, that really helped with membership. And this is the time when the NRA gets all this misconduct and all this financial misspending that happens inside the organization. This is where a lot of it begins. Mm -hmm. And it's very effective during the Obama years when they're able to sell that fear. And they use a lot of this money to try to elect and help elect Donald Trump. In fact, the NRA spends more money supporting Donald Trump's election bid in 2016 than even the Trump super PAC, more than yeah. $30 million, yeah. a substantial amount of money. Yeah. But the real irony is that although the NRA really wanted the, the election of Donald Trump uh, and its members really wanted the election of Donald Trump, that once Donald Trump is actually in office, membership declines, fundraising falls off a cliff. And there's no strategy within the NRA to deal with that. <laughs> and so in that financial contraction, we talked earlier about Oliver North. That's where all these problems begin to come about. Oliver North gets brought on to deal with that problem, starts asking questions about, hey, where's all this money going? And it leads to this dramatic confrontation that's blowing up in the public and leading to where we are now. So from that, you had members revolting, people on the board of directors protesting, the direction of the organization. Multiple congressional investigations were launched into the NRA. And the New York Attorney General, now the NRA was originally founded in New York, so the New York Attorney General has jurisdiction over the NRA as a nonprofit. So the New York Attorney General launched an investigation about two years ago and found after an 18-month investigation that the NRA had, had committed tens of millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars worth of illegal spending and misconduct. And so the New York Attorney General filed a lawsuit seeking to dissolve the NRA in its entirety. And it's a real mortal challenge to the NRA and its future. Would we be a better country if this if the NRA goes down? Do you, what, what would your bet be if you were a betting man? I don't know if you are or not, but if you're a betting man, do you think they're going to survive it? I, I think they tried to move to Texas and that got shot down by a judge. So they tried to declare bankruptcy in order to move to Texas. They were gonna use, so if you declare bankruptcy, you get all these protections under the law to mm -hmm. reorganize, emerge from bankruptcy. And they tried to use this as a way to move to Texas and get away from their, their responsibilities in New York. But the bankruptcy judge basically said, no, I don't think that this is a filing being made in good faith, and wow. I'm gonna reject this attempt to file for bankruptcy. And so now they're back in court with the New York Attorney General. Wow. Do you, if you're a betting man, do you think they're going to survive? I'm not quite a betting man. I, I'm not ready to put it all on red, but look, it's a, it's, you can do black any, if you any, want. Any observer, any observer of the current situation has to admit that there is a serious possibility that a judge will say that the NRA needs to be shut down. Yeah. And if it, with that being the case, it's a, uh, it's a, it's an, it would be an incredible outcome for the future of our gun politics in the country. It would be it would be great. It, you you can have any other sort of weapon, even just buying alcohol or or weed or anything else, and everything has got to be. I'm not for taking away people's guns. I'm not for banning guns like maybe New Zealand or Australia, but definitely limiting some of the guns. You don't need you need like a tank, okay? You don't need a nuclear weapon. You don't need a I don't know an F50 or whatever the hell they're called, the tank guns and stuff like that. Come on, man. And <laughs> I always love how my friends that love guns are like, we'll have to take the government on. I think, wasn't it Biden who said, have you seen that we have drones and stuff? Like, you're not going to win a war with this government. Not at all. That was great when we all had muskets and, I don't know, we were a colony of a few hundred people or something, but now. But yeah, it, it's interesting. And I'm glad you documented this because the story is amazing. The stories are amazing. Anything else you want to touch on in the book that we can tease out to readers to get them to pick it up? Yeah, so the, the book starts with this scene at Wayne LaPierre's wedding in the late night. And it's an important scene because I, I really think that the NRA finds itself in the financial and legal trouble that it finds itself today because of personality issues with Wayne. Uh -huh. he, he's, he's the head of this 
powerful and controversial organization, but he's incredibly conflict averse. He's someone who's deeply anxious. And I kind of show that with an anecdote mm. from the late 90s at his wedding. Mm. Um, the wedding ceremony time comes and passes. and He's not there. Wow. Uh, he doesn't want to get married. And he's been <laughs> telling his friends all week he doesn't want to get married. And his best man's outside with him and puts a $100 bill on the dashboard of the car and says, hey, I, I don't think you should get married either. When we can get out of here right now, if you want, I'll drive you. But he goes through with it. He goes in, he gets harangued into the ceremony by his bride. And there's this, there's this totally weird ceremony that happens. All these NRA luminaries are in the audience watching this incredibly awkward ceremony transpire yeah. he, he won't make eye contact with his bride he's looking up he's looking down he's looking around yeah. and but he goes through with it and this is a lesson for all sorts of people in the nra over the years and like i said i, I think it's emblematic of his character in a lot of ways that people have learned powerful people in and around the nra have learned that if you push win lapierre around hard enough he's eventually going to say yes to whatever it is. And that's why so many of these contracts, these sweetheart deals for, for NRA vendors end up happening and the golden parachutes for former senior executives who leave the organization get paid incredible sums of money to do almost nothing. That's why they happen as well. It's a real pattern inside the organization. Yeah. It, I forget who the Russian's name was, the red hair gal. She got repatriated that's Maria back. Bettina. Maria Bettina is like such a really interesting character in this book that Maria Bettina is someone who spent years networking with NRI officials and getting them to basically open all these doors for her, whether mm -hmm. it's uh, money for her travel or for her conferences or networking and introducing her to people. The NRA got so easily played by someone who ended up getting charged and convicted. Yeah. of being a of conspiring to be an unregistered Russian agent and who went to jail and was ultimately deported. It, it's an astonishing story. She only had a very flirtatious demeanor. Yeah. And it's something that a lot of people who knew her over time repeatedly talked about. Yeah. And it seemed like a lot of the guys were like, hey, we're around this cute gal. And so I, I figured something was up. That was my assumption. Yeah, this is really interesting. Are they still in trouble with, uh, are they still getting sued by the video arm, the TV arm? Yeah, there, there, there's still ongoing litigation between uh, the NRA and its longtime advertising firm, which ha has for many decades been really who they depended on for advice yeah. and strategy and crisis communications and things like that. And that divorce has been incredibly nasty. The it, it's been it's been one of those breakups that has had a lot of serious effects for the NRA. Yeah, I, it seems like they just, I, it's just been amazing how they just fell so hard. And for a while there, I was just like, yeah, this is awesome. But some of their stuff was just so toxic. When people listen to the tapes that you released on your, with your book, listening to people just callously, I mean, these are people that got slaughtered and died in, in, in just like cattle. And they're just so callous and cold to it. They're just talking about it like it was nothing. And you're just sitting there going, my God, people died. These were human beings. And all they're worried about is their money and their little organization. Yeah, those tapes that, you were, that we're talking about earlier about Columbine is so instructive about the way the NRA ends up handling itself, not just after Columbine, but for many years to come. It, they, you you see it, hear them and you see them developing their playbook yeah. uh, for mass shootings from Columbine onwards. And it's amazing to hear how they end up talking about people and strategizing. Yeah, it's just extraordinary. Well, anything more you want to tease out in the book, Tim, before? I'd love for folks to, if they're interested in kind of the behind the scenes look of the NRA and these wild characters and who they are, from Wayne LaPierre and his wife, Susan, to Oliver North and all sorts of figures in between to pick up the book. There you go. You get into the money too, all the money he spent. Were you Definitely. able to dig up all that? Huh? Millions That's... of dollars in private jets Holy and crap, the lavish man. meals, details about their vacations, the mansion that Wayne and Susan wanted to buy in, De in Texas. Oh, that's right. Um, all, all sorts of things in there, including also the weird cast of characters and people with felony convictions and um, embezzlement allegations all around Wayne LaPierre and, and the senior levels of the NRA. There you go. Buy his book and send it to all your NRA friends. I don't know if they can read, but oops. 
What did I say? I'm just teasing. I lost the NRA crowd. But that's okay. We lost it years ago. Anyway, Tim, thanks for being on the show. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming by. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. There you guys go. Order up the book. Uh, you can go get it wherever fine books are sold, but only go to where those fine books are sold. Don't go in those bookstore alleyways because they're dirty and there's needles and sometimes there's ruffians in there. Ruffians? What kind of, what is it, the 1800s? Anyway, guys, pick it up. Misfire, Inside the Downfall of the NRA by Tim Mack. You'll want to pick that baby up and uh, be the first one to read it. Uh, and uh, let's see, audio, Kindle book, and hardcover. Also go to youtube.com for says Chris Voss. You can see the video version of this. Go to goodreads.com for says Chris Voss. All of our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, all those places those crazy kids are playing. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other, and we'll see you guys next time.